Welcome back, boys and girls, for another special edition of the Michael Deacon Program. Joining me in a moment is Mr. Brad Olson. He has made his return. Brad Olson is a known author and researcher in the fields of alternative history, ancient civilizations, and esoteric knowledge. He has written several books that explore topics such as secret societies, ancient mysteries, and the hidden history of humanity. Please put your hands together for our guest, Mr. Brad Olson. Hey, Michael. I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day in northwestern Nevada. Nice fall day. The colors are changing and uh, looks like we're going to have another monster winter on the way. Well, I could uh, hardly wait for that. And luckily, I'm out here in Southern California. And, uh, you know, most people in the East Coast, most people that listen to this program are out there in the East Coast. And I feel bad for them. A lot of them have to put chains around their tires and plow their driveways, all things that I'm glad I don't need to do. <laughs> well, I'm up here uh, just an hour away from Lake Tahoe, and I'm ready for ski season. Oh, I'm yeah. waxing up my skis, get ready to go. Very nice. And of course, for those who don't know, Brad, you're uh, you're a traveling man, and every time I talk to you, you're somewhere new, basically. Kind of get around a lot. That's true. Just back now from another two and a half week trip down to southern california that was great yeah I or know. southern uh, southern nevada right i used to be in california correct nevada. and you were out at this conference uh, this big conference matter of fact yeah yeah it was a good one um it's called stairway to the stars uh knew all the most of the speakers and uh yeah i think they're gonna do it every year so hope to be uh invited a, to be a speaker next year a regular yeah and uh, for sure, I saw the list of people. Everybody was out there. And what is the scene like right now as someone who is heavily involved in the talk circuit? Uh, I'm curious, what is being discussed by the more uh, prominent fellow uh, speakers of yours? Yeah, uh, it was pretty non-political, so didn't get into too much what's going on in the world in Ukraine or Israel, which is probably a good thing. Uh, a lot of the discussion still carrying over from Contact the Desert, and that is the testimony by Grush and what that means with these congressional hearings. That's good to see that that story has not gone away because this is pretty big news once you have Congress looking into UFOs and ETs and uh, bodies recovered. That's a good thing. That is when the little drip 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 of disclosure starts to become a pretty steady flow right but it's not like anybody at these conferences is holding their breath and waiting for um the government to come fully out with it we feel like disclosure is from the ground up disclosure is you and i having this discussion and going over the latest revelations understood and yeah that's something that we didn't really actually get a chance to discuss the fact that you know, we were both at a contact in the desert just this year, and that was during the height, I would say, uh, during the whole debriefing a uh, document that made waves around um, all over the place, really international waves. Yeah, it is a big story, and it is continued to hold. That is, this whistleblower named David Grush has not been 
thrown under the bus or said he's a disinformationist. His credentials are impeccable, and he is uh, who he says he is. And if he was working on these uh, secret access programs with the ability to go to uh, discover crash sites, retrievals, right, and got his eyes on some bodies. I mean, that's huge. That is just absolutely amazing that this would come out through a congressional hearing. Absolutely. And I know you've been following along, and it seems like a lot of people have a hard time following along, a matter of fact. So many different people have come forward with uh, different information that we've all heard one time or another. I mean, uh, Grush came out with a third party. It wasn't like a... It, first-hand accounts. Uh, it was all people that he knew that held high clearance out there. And I know, well, I'm assuming things here, but I have a feeling that you believe that there are actual extraterrestrials and our own, um, I guess, our own branch of Air Force and government also involved in the abduction scenario of all this. <laughs> Well, that is the other side of it, and this is pretty much what Stephen Greer maintains, is that there are no alien abductions, he says, that it's all being done through the My Labs and through these programs that basically uh, are imitating UFOs, even flying them around, and they're the ones who's doing all this. And I, I would say that they probably have done some of it, but I wouldn't say every single cattle mutilation or human abduction yeah. is just a my operation. It seems that there is a, a malevolent ET group that is also responsible for that. I agree with you 100%. I don't think it's all a uh, government really. And, and he thinks that that about most cases really. And I, I don't, I have a hard time believing that. Yeah. Yeah. I've met, Dr. Greer a couple times. I like him. I think it's great what he's done for the movement. But when he throws a red herring out every once in a while and says something like that, that there's no such thing as ETs doing abductions, mm, kind of throws me uh, in a different direction. Right. But maybe he's got some kind of agenda. Absolutely. And he claims that um, they're, they're not nefarious in any way, that these things are not hostile, in other words. I guess when you get to the point where a, a an extraterrestrial is so advanced that they can communicate telepathically, that they have technology beyond our wildest dreams, that it would seem that they can do things that aren't harmful to people. Even if they're probing them, even if they're abducting them, swiping their memory, harvesting eggs from females, there comes a point where if they're doing it forcefully or under the cover and the people who are getting abducted aren't even aware of it, well, that goes against our free will. And that's something that um, can never be a good thing. And that is certainly a service to self agenda by those malevolent ETs and that needs to be called out. So right. when you get uh, something, yeah, that's sort of distracting us or send redirection, uh, I, I don't think that's really helpful for the cause to uh, uh -oh. just say not all aliens are bad. Got a caller already? Uh, that, yeah, I'm not here. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> don't think take. I, well, I don't think that was on my end. I think somebody was calling you, Brad. Oh, I didn't. I didn't see anything pop up. Oh, that's so okay. anyways, we're not taking calls. No, no, no. <laughs> that's okay, and. You know, even more disturbing enough is the whole account of that other whistleblower, that uh, Michael Herrera guy. I'm not sure if you um, are familiar with him of, about what he saw out in, like, I guess, out in the jungle. He saw a, a big uh, UFO craft, and there was, like, black op marine officers surrounding an area. And he said they were, like, trafficking humans, by the way. Right. That's kind of yeah, creepy, by weird. the way. It is, it is. And Tim Alberino. Uh, has been doing a lot of reporting on that. And I've met Tim. He's a great guy, and he's doing fantastic work out there. And that's the other thing. When when you're talking about abduction or harvesting people or animals, that's a service to self-agenda. And those are the kind of ETs we don't want to be allying ourselves with. It's the ones who have a service to all agenda 
that want to help the human race. And those would be the ones, if in some future date we could sit at the same table, would be the kind of ETs that we would align ourselves with. Yeah, that's really, um, really a crazy business to be involved in um, trafficking humans or um, even even like wild exotic animals, even the people that are involved in that are unsavory characters, in my opinion. Yeah. And the thing with these conferences, Michael, and we met at a few of them and, yeah, you know, I speak a lot of them and I sit in a lot of sessions. I'm one of the few speakers that I'm trying to constantly upgrade my information and get as much information I can. The thing with these conferences, it's still considered fringe information. Yeah. And main media won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Uh, government barely acknowledges that it exists. And of course, educational and higher learning institutions shun away from it too. So we're kind of left on our own. And it is a self policing industry. And those who are out to profit off of it or charlatans they eventually get exposed and bounced out of the scene and new speakers quickly move in. But it's, it's really, to me, it's an integrity thing that you have to be able to change your opinion with new information, just like anything like the scientific method. You have to be able to make decisions based on new evidence and build from there. If you're ever stuck to any storyline or narrative well you're doing yourself and anybody who follows you a disservice and sometimes these subjects are pretty dark we talked about uh human abductions also the cattle mutilations that, that there has not been a single arrest for anyone mutilating animals in the way that they have appeared with bored out body parts for the soft tissue including eyeballs tongues cheek uh, even rectums, laser precision boring to extract these items, as well as taking out all the white blood cells and then dropping these animals sometimes in the winter back in the field where they were, where there's no footprints in the snow, there's broken branches underneath the animal. There was just a video that surfaced about a month ago. The guy, I guess he had lost a couple cattle and put a video in his uh, cow shed and it's just rolling and you see the cows sitting in there eating and all of a sudden great big heifer comes crashing through the roof and he caught it all on film how do you get how do you get a 700 pound cow dropping from the sky and then crashing through a barn wow. and there's no way this fakes yeah so there's still evidence this is going on. Now, my understanding is a lot of the animal mutilations no longer uh, are being plucked out of the farm fields across America, but mostly around the Four Corner region. The very first animal abductions were in the San Luis Valley, southern Colorado, where it meets uh, Taos, New Mexico. Uh -huh. And the very first animal wasn't even a cow. It was Snippy the horse. Snippy the horse. And that was right by the great sand dunes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And uh, then cows started following and a couple of colleagues of mine were early investigators. That's Linda Wilton Howe and Christopher O'Ryan, who wrote a series of books about stalking the herd in the Mystery Valley. And Linda Wilton Howe was a local reporter, I think out of Colorado Springs. And they get, well, you got another story here about cattle mutilations in San Luis Valley. Linda would raise her hand, I'm on it, I'll go do it. And that's how she got into this whole field. So it started with the high strangeness of these animal mutilations, and then the fact that nobody's been arrested. The FBI would say, oh, they're satanic rituals, but nobody ever gets arrested. And the f farmers are just kind of shit out of luck. Right, Sorry, that's true. It's funny because yeah. early on, that's exactly what... Uh, law enforcement thought when once it was first reported and they were seeing these cows like uh, mutil mutilated they thought it was the work of a uh, satanist and people in cults yeah it's not because there's never been an arrest never been a video sighting of someone doing these horrific animal mutilations and then how do you come up with the idea that 
whoever's doing this can somehow drop them out of the sky. You need right. some kind of high tech uh, flying craft or at least a helicopter to do that. But why would they do that? Why would they extract all these strange body parts? Well, this it true. turns out this is how the gray aliens feed themselves. And this is this comes from a number of sources, but mainly from those who have seen the grays rubbing an organic solution, sometimes combined with blood mm. on their skin. That's how they eat, not through their mouth or any other way. They absorb it through the skin. And what's so interesting about cow blood, Michael, in an extreme emergency, say it was wartime and it was yeah. life or death, you could actually substitute cow blood into a human to keep that person alive. Oh, wow. You'd eventually have to get up to the hospital and then do another blood transfusion. But if it was a matter of life or death, yeah. they could survive off of cow blood. So there's similar DNA in cows that apparently these... Uh, bloodthirsty gray aliens uh, have a taste for interesting and yes i've heard other accounts as well uh that people believe that there are those uh, cattle mutilations done by us as well um our own uh, sort of um i guess air force or the my labs or the, the military Mylab, yeah. laboratories yeah and and it could very well be that some of them do that perhaps the my labs are working on behalf of these gray alien species yeah that, that's the other thing uh brad eat. you know i i wouldn't have believed a lot of this my lab stuff uh, years ago i always kind of thought uh, you know I, I believe in a lot of uh, strange conspiracies like yourself brad but you know there's some that i don't really fully believe in and i'll ask you in a moment which ones you don't exactly believe in but that was one of them that i kind of had a hard time believing that our own government would be doing those sort of experiments but then Lo and behold, it almost kind of seems like that's exactly what's been going on. And, of course, you see what was going on in Peru. Uh, the villagers were yep. saying they were being attacked by these aliens, but it turns out it seems like these were, in my opinion, uh, some sort of a branch of our own military, some sort of black ops military. And there's some sort of video that also leaked of a guy on top of a tree putting on some sort of a suit, an all-black sort of suit. And um, there's been some pretty strange things going on with faces and necks being, uh, skin being pulled off of uh, some of the bodies found out there. Yeah, and I'm a follower of Timothy Alberino, and he says, through his reporting, I think he even went down there, that uh, this was real, that there was some kind of stalking ET. It was a, a tall gray I believe is we the way you described it, and those ones have been kind of notorious for doing these abductions and cattle mutilations. And some girl had been confronted. They almost had her, but she wiggled free and wow. ran back to the village. But the this is what's interesting, Michael. The villagers knew about it. So as soon as she came running into the town, yelling and screaming, they were all ready to arm up and go confront them with just shotguns and rifles. And some of them had their video cameras on and caught some some images of it. But Timothy Alberino said he he could tell that the whole village knew that they were very frightened by the experience. If there was really no motive in it for them to perpetuate a hoax, not how do you get the whole village to go along with something if it's fake, right? But everybody was really scared about this and was actually quite glad that some people would go down there and, and offer them some insight of what's going on or perhaps help. So to me, that makes it a much more believable story. Oh, I agree. It's a very believable story, and they were genuinely uh, frightened, and I think they obviously experienced something. And yes, it, it would take a lot of effort to get the whole village to agree with what they saw, kind of like the whole Zimbabwe case out there in the, in the uh, 90s. When all these school right. children saw the uh, UFO calm down and they saw these aliens emerge from the craft, yeah, a lot of kids saw that. And it would take a lot of effort to get all those kids to agree. First and foremost, that, that's pretty hard. That's right. And, and I, I'm glad you brought up the Zimbabwe case because there's a, another perfect example of dozens or perhaps up to 100 people witnessing the same thing, reporting on the same thing, and no ulterior motive for them to make something up otherwise 
So when you have that many data points that suggest the exact same thing happened, it's a pretty good chance that's what happened. Right. And just quickly here, Brad, I mentioned uh, certain conspiracy theories that I personally don't believe in very much. Well, I didn't really get into detail, but are there things out there, conspiracy theories per se, that you don't really hold that much weight and you're, you're, you know, you're not, you're kind of iffy in other words about them. Yeah, there are, you know, that I went down to Antarctica five years ago. Right. Right. And it troubles me when people say that it's a flat earth and there's an ice wall because I stepped on the continent. I explored the continent. I was looking over my captain's shoulder, studying the top topography maps, even the underwater maps that matched exactly what I saw uh, outside. And it's a continental landmass down there, and flat earthers are in denial that Antarctica even exists. So that's one that's a bit of my pet peeve with firsthand knowledge that uh, there is a frozen continent down there. My goodness, why, why have you received so much backlash from the flat earth community, Brad? I've noticed that, by the way. Well, I think for that exact reason is because I'm calling it out and saying uh, I've been down there, I've experienced the continent, uh, here's proof, they don't want to hear it. Uh, I did <laughs> two, hour, two yeah. hours of my time. With oh, yeah, that's right. One that's right. It was going round and round in circles with that guy. There oh, was my. no real, yeah, no real um, d disclosure on his part that I couldn't say that's well, I, just I, not true. I apologize on his behalf. I, I actually did the unfortunate thing of uh, interviewing him myself, and that uh, episode really never made made the light of day. In other words, uh, that's probably a good thing. It <laughs> went nowhere. Yeah. Well, what are your pet peeves in the uh, disclosure movement? Or well, that that's one of them. Uh, the flat Earth theory, and there's lots of flat right. Earthers out there who obviously hate the program. They think I work for NASA. Uh, oddly enough, they, I'm like, what? There's a lot of uh, strange things I, I've heard about myself in terms of uh, outsiders looking in here. Uh, but yeah, flat earth is obviously one I definitely don't have. A, I, I just don't believe in at all. I, I was going to say something else, but I'll keep it PG-13 here and, and say I just can't believe it. I can't believe it at all, Brad. It's, no, out, it's out of it's, control. Oh, I, I was going to say, are they trolling or do they really believe that? Well, I think they do. And just remember about 15 years ago, nobody ever talked about flat earth. It just came out of the blue about 10, 15 years ago. Right. And I've reviewed the material. I've watched the videos. And to me, it just doesn't make any sense, especially in the context of traveling to Antarctica. But those are very slick videos. And I've uh, I've talked to a few people about it. Where did they come from? Who's doing it? Because obviously some money had to come up. Well, right. Um, Gene Decode, he's not a flat earther either, and he says that uh, it's a Darwa project. And turns out uh, Juan Osavin says the same thing. That, and he even traced the money, several million dollars, um, to create yeah. these videos, these flat Earth videos, and. One step further, that money actually came from none other than the Jesuits. And the Jesuits, well, they believe in the firmament that uh, the sky is this fixed stars that just move around. And there was flat earth in Christianity up till uh, 500 years ago. You know, to have our discussion say, no, the earth is a sphere, you could get burned at the stake during the Inquisition to right. say these things. So now it's kind of gone backwards, and I'm kicking myself. Uh, we used to say, oh, yeah, well, we've come a long way since uh, people stopped believing in the flat earth, and now it comes back. Oh, no, <laughs> not again. Right, and one thing I've been telling every guest is it, it's ironic how uh, history is repeating itself, Brad, in so many different ways, and it's more than, it's more than just synchronicity at this point. Yeah, way more than synchronicity, and... When you look at why DARPA or even the Jesuits would want to put out this kind of disinformation, it is a way to keep us arguing over something that really doesn't matter, right. that's nonsensical, that we're, we're already spending 15 minutes on this subject, yes. and we could have been talking <laughs> things that are more important, right? That's correct. So. This is true, and 
Brad, you know, you've written about Antarctica extensively and its connection to UFOs. And I'm wondering what initially drew your attention to this remote region. And as you know, being uh, from the desert, I'm just thinking, my God, why would you go out there? It's so cold. <laughs> yeah, Michael, you've been you've been sitting in the sun too long and right. getting used to the warm weather. Well, I'm, uh, I'm half German, half Norwegian. I like the cold. I like skiing. And it just didn't affect me like some people. Right, and right. yeah, it was very cold down there. But we went in the middle of summer. So the Antarctica season, the travel season begins right around now, goes till early March, and that's summer down there. Yeah, the seasons flip. Oh, by the way, all the stars are completely different down there. You see the Southern Cross in the uh -huh. sky instead of the the Big Dipper, and more reason proof that uh, the Earth is spherical. So the Southern Hemisphere is quite different. There's way more oceans in the South. This is why the ancient Greeks theorized there must be a southern continent and they would have had a knowledge of the entire world including the shape and size of the continent they were within a couple percentages of getting the circumference of the earth exactly correct they even knew it was how big it was and how round it was and it was the ancient greeks that came up with the name for antarctica and it went like this so in the Northern Hemisphere, there is a constellation called Arctos, and they theorize that in the Southern Hemisphere, there must be another Arctos or Anti-Arctos. Anti-Arctos, Antarctica, that's how the name came about. Given by the ancient Greeks, who for centuries, um, <clears throat> humans didn't go down there. And I do... Uh, one of my talks at conferences, Michael, is about starts with all the different maps during the age of exploration that show Antarctica on the map without it ever being discovered and without it ever being known, just that it was theorized from the time of the ancient Greeks that it was down there. Well, finally, Captain Kirk circumnavigated the Southern Ocean at the end of the 18th century, so around 1795. He sailed the whole circumference, never once sighting Antarctica, but he did get below the Antarctic Circle. So he goes back to the Academy of Sciences and says, no, nope, there is no continent down there. And for the first time, modern maps of that age did not show it. But Captain Cook published his diary of the trip and said that there was a plethora of whales and seals for the harvesting and it was the merchant marines who went down there to capitalize on whale blubber which they needed for oil lamps at the time and seal coats for clothing <clears throat> those were the people that first discovered antarctica in 1821 so just a little over 200 years ago that continent had never been set foot on in this modern age but I would say that it was known that it was down there because one of those maps that I show and I examine it in much greater detail is the Peary Reese map from 1513. So just 21 years after Columbus, who, by the way, never realized he had discovered the new continent. To his deathbed, Columbus said that this was these are the islands off of India. And that's why we have the misguided uh, name of our Native Americans being Indians and why they still call the islands in the Caribbean the West Indies, because it was Columbus thinking he discovered the islands of India, whereas where uh, Sri Lanka and Maldives and uh, the islands around Indonesia, that's where he thought he went. But the Piri Reis map, which shows the full uh, continental landmass of South America, that is on the east facing side with remarkable detail and accuracy and also shows Antarctica, what it would have looked like before the ice. And this is what's really fascinating to me because on the Piri Reese map, it says not only was it drawn from source maps that date all the way back to the Library of Alexandria, but it also has reference to the Ptolemy Greeks and that is in the age after Alexander the Great with the Ptolemies, and they were the last dynasty in Egypt of pharaohs. But they're really 
Hellenistic Greeks. So this map even says straight out, we date this information thousands of years back. And with that kind of information, then you can have a pretty good idea, like Charles Hapgood's title, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, that they were using these maps, exchanging information. And if you were a pirate or took over another ship, the most valuable thing on that captured ship would be its maps. That was the first thing they would go for is the lockbox in the captain's quarters to steal their maps. Because if you don't know where you're going, right. <laughs> you're going to get lost pretty quick. That's right. But the you're... maps would get that way around. Absolutely. So initially, that is what sort of drew your attention to this region, this uh, rich history, in other words. A very rich history. And just that I'm a, I'm a cartographer myself. I study maps all the time. I'm fascinated with them. I love to see how the physical characteristics of the planet continue to be updated and changed. I show a map in, in this talk of Antarctica in 1940 when some of the people in the audience were just little kids. And it shows huge amounts of Antarctica that it's still never been charted or mapped. It was part of Operation High Jump with Admiral Byrd in 1946 that they did start charting out uh, Marie Birdland, which is the area named after his wife. He also named after some of his benefactors like Edsel Ford and uh, there's the Rockefeller Plateau. There's even a Rothschild Island, the southern part of the Palmer Peninsula. And when I was charting out my trip five years ago, I talked to my colleague, Dr. Michael Sala, said, what do you know on the Palmer Peninsula? Anything weird or paranormal I should try to check out? And he says, oh, yeah, Brad, why don't you go on down there to uh, uh, the Rothschild Island? See if you can get on there. <laughs> you got an Australian accent. Yeah. <laughs> and I get that far down. It's way below the Antarctic Circle. But right. uh, I appreciated the tip. And sure enough, there is a big Rothschild Island down there. And that's where they said those uh, top people from the World Economic Forum went to about a year and a half ago. That being Klaus Schwab and Christine Lagarde were summoned to Rothschild Island in Antarctica. So, you know, they must have some kind of base down there because you look at it on Google Earth, you're not going to find anything uh, that, that would indicate there's any kind of settlement or base there. That's right. And it's mind blowing to me that there's so many people out there, the majority of people out there, uh, completely unaware about all this stuff that uh, surrounds them. In other words, all these occult symbols hidden by the founding fathers, uh, basically at the heart of our governmental administration. And all its landmarks, I mean, it all means something. And most people in general just sort of overlook what these symbols are and, and actually mean and what they're used for. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's... It's a hard that's sell, though. To, it's a hard sell, though, to, to say that as someone uh, that's not in this realm, uh, Brad, unfortunately. Well, they should know because this is, this is important. This is the zeitgeist of the age. I agree, though. We don't even have a like zeitgeist in English, but it's it's the the spirit of the age, and that's uh, what we're what we're facing. Yes, it's a very uh, exciting time to be alive with a lot of new information always coming to the fore. Absolutely, and I apologize for digressing there. I just thought that was quite interesting. But back on track here in terms of Antarctica, um, uh, why do so many consider it a I guess you can say a hot spot for UFO activity in your opinion? Well, because there is some pretty good information that there had been not only a high-tech civilization in Antarctica, and we've all heard the stories of pyramids poking through the roofs. I'm right. investigating this. I always do. But also, Michael Sala gave me some information, uh, a new GPS coordinates of mm -hmm. an area in the New Schwabenland area claim with perfect right angles that look like the foundations of megalithic buildings. So until we get more information on that particular yeah. area, some people even think that Antarctica could be even lost Atlantis. Mm. And if you think about the mid Atlantic Ridge, so right in between the two continents, all the way up to Iceland, which is known as the land of fire and ice. And they're having 
a big volcanic uh, episode right now. The, that uh, whole fault line is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it goes between Africa and South America straight on down right to Antarctica. And the region I went to in the Palmer Peninsula region, that's a relatively new landmass. That's only 700 million years old. And when I say only, that's because the larger continental landmass of East Antarctica is over 3 billion years old. And that's the one that broke off from Pangaea or Gondwanaland so long ago and moved to its present position. Whereas the Palmer Peninsula is like a different, separate continental landmass that did come down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And a lot of these uh, supposed uh, Atlantis yeah. ruins, such as the pyramids in the Ellsworth Range, is in the uh, West Antarctic New Continental Landmass. And and that's very dramatic. Those are the, the cliffs that are... Uh, the mountains just straight up out of the ocean with glaciers flowing down and ancient civilization wow. does appear in this western Antarctica peninsula, the Palmer Peninsula, which did break off from uh, the mid-Atlantic Ridge and move to its present location during the last pole shift or when the continents rise and fall and shift and move around. Turns out those pole shift events on Earth are a lot more common than we had given credit for. That oh, they yeah. do occur on a pretty regular basis, and we may even be due for the for next one. one. I agree. And the yeah. evidence mm -hmm. is because the magnetic poles, which is totally different from the geographic poles that spin the axis of the planet, they're on the move. And they're never quite where the North and South Pole are. So the North Pole uh, geomagnetic pole has normally been in the Hudson Bay area, northern Hudson Bay. And it's now racing across the Arctic Ocean towards Siberia. Whereas down in Antarctica, the magnetic South Pole is racing off of the continent now. It's moving up towards New Zealand. And it's already off the continental landmass. So if you're sailing a boat right along the coast, and you're doing a compass reading, your magnetic north would point you away from Antarctica. That's how much it's already diverged. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, lots of Earth changes are actually occurring right before our uh, very own eyes. Uh, you have uh, most of the East Coast sinking as well, uh, according to uh, the science, by the way. I'm not sure how accurate that may or may not be, but that's also something. Uh, and, of course, you mentioned the volcano uh, that we were all seeing earlier in the news. And, you know, out here in America, we, we have the, the same threat, by the way. That could happen here. Sure. Yeah, especially on the West Coast where we're both at. Right. And it seems we might be due for something like that, too. A big earthquake or something that could trigger a volcano, and that would, um, that would really screw us over. <laughs> if it would erupt uh, out here, we would be doomed. And lots of people think that we're completely safe, but um, every now and then, you know, we're faced by one of these sort of uh, some one of these uh, natural events, and that would really wreck us. Furthermore, uh, Brad, as you know, we're out here in California. The next big one can be uh, any time. Is that what they're saying? No, I I don't I don't think they're saying that exactly, but um, some scientists do actually believe that we are due for one however and uh, being out here in california as you know this is where the where the earthquakes always go down yeah well it's the ring of fire and the ring of fire goes all the way down to antarctica as well some of the biggest earthquakes ever recorded in the world are along the humboldt trench off the west coast of south america and then up in Juneau, alaska in 1964 massive earthquake and those those ones that yeah. are that big, it actually changes the landscape. Wow. You'd have portion of the seashore sinking into the ocean. You've got other areas that crack, and uh, oh my God. we just saw what happened. Turkey yeah. a couple of months ago. You see that big crack that remained. Now that one was most likely a uh, weather weapon. That was probably harp, which harp. is okay, yeah. capable. Yeah, of, of triggering massive earthquakes because Turkey was 
getting uh, on NATO's back about supporting the Ukraine war, saying that they're going to change uh, sides and support Ukraine mm. or support the Russians. And then, of right. course, now with uh, Israel, too, Turkey has gone against NATO. So they were warned not to do that, uh, specifically their position with Ukraine, just a week before that massive earthquake in south western southeastern turkey on the border of syria created a rift that went for many miles and was very deep and destroyed this very fertile farmland area and but the weird thing about it and this is why i think it was a harp attack there were these mysterious red clouds Ooh. that were appearing He's videos with them on there that all these things were happening the animals were going crazy the birds were all chirping and then Boom, this thing hits and it hit hard. My goodness. And by the way, I, I went and looked up uh, to see if there were any reports about the next big one, quote unquote. And there is, by the way, the uh, some, yeah, they say the, the threat of earthquakes extends across the entire San Francisco Bay region and a major quake is likely to happen before 2032. So we got some time. Well, that's in 10 years away. Yeah, we got some time, but I mean, uh, I'm still frying. I'm still frying the of the possibility of the next big one happening, regardless of what uh, anyone uh, says. Well, the weird thing about earthquakes is it's very difficult to predict exactly when they happen. They have a few scientific instruments, and even animals are good at predicting earthquakes that their behavior will change. But that's only uh, a few seconds or minutes before it actually strikes. Certainly not enough time to give people forewarning, oh, there's an earthquake coming up on noon on Tuesday, so you can pack up and load the kids up and go somewhere. Rarely ever have that kind of forewarning. Right. So when they do hit, they hit quite suddenly. That's right. And as someone who also is someone who researches um, conspiracies and all these sort of things, where does it exactly does it stop for you, though, Brad? I mean, um, in regards to not just where the where you put the proverbial line in, in the sand, this sort of thing, like in flat in regards to like flat Earth, but let's say something like in terms of religion, um, have you ever looked into uh, that, for instance? And thought perhaps that maybe this was just uh, another tool for social control. Yeah. Well, I like that quote from William Cooper speaking at the UFO Congress in 1989, a very famous speech. You can still find it on right, YouTube. Yeah. And he said it was learned then and is known now that the ETs have been manipulating humans using secret societies, witchcraft, magic, the occult and religion. So any way they could get people to believe in their powers as being something supernatural would give them the advantage, even akin to being a God or our Lord. Isn't it right. interesting how many things we call our Lord, our land Lord, mm -hmm. the Lord of the land and the Lord of the sky. Uh, yeah, these overlords are the ones who have been doing all this uh, skull drudgery all along according to this Bill Cooper quote, and that is what has given the elite their power. And there is this technique that some of these malevolent ETs do called shadowing or foreshadowing, where they'll just follow, they'll be able to follow around some of these cutouts that have aligned with them in an invisible way. None of us would be able to see it, but there have been some films uh, of them, including big Draco-like beings coming down into a house in washington wow. dc yeah but but the shadowing is basically and sometimes that can be caught too but they will work on behalf of these elite who have sold their soul to the devil i think i have understood what that meant i never wow. could understand it as a kid but it's quite evident that if you do align yourself with this dark cabal and what do you want fame or fortune right. or power over people well, they'll help you attain that by shadowing you. And what that means is, so you're going into the big meeting and you want to close this multi-million dollar deal and you'll get a huge commission. They'll foreshadow. They'll get into people's minds. They'll use their telepathy to convince those who might be opposed to your plan 
uh, to go along with it. Same with actors. Why do you think they do all that Illuminati symbolism? They've sold their soul to the devil. In my book, Future Esoteric, I make the case and the conclusion that all these things that we knew from religion are really just aliens. So you have the Draco reptilian. Isn't it interesting how similar they look to the depictions of the devil? The, the, the great big ugly looking creatures that will eat a human and they all live underground, by the way, in this place called hell. And then you, their little uh, minions could be the gray aliens doing all the dirty work and shepherding people around. I mean, it's just like uh, Dante's Inferno or or the uh, Herm Hermatius Bosch's painting of the underworld where all these uh, hideous creatures are existing. Well, I'll tell you, there was a really great presentation at Stairway to the Stars by Jay Widener. He used to be one of the producers at Gaia TV. And he was talking in very scientific terms about the plasma world. And all plasma is, is uh, it's just being electrified in such a way that somehow you can catch a glimpse of these of other dimensions. So this is when you're catching some of these creatures uh, that are shadowing the elite. And Jay Widener is saying all the paranormal experiences, all the gremlins, goblins, elves, fairies, it's a, it's a whole universe of weird little creatures out there that normally we can never see with the naked eye. Right. And, and Brad, but they uh, emanate from this plasma world. Brad, I hate to uh, cut you off, but... And it was all about the world of plasma and this is also cutting edge science because now we can finally determine through the scientific method examining this plasma world this other element the fifth uh, force of the universe is plasma that it is a teeming world of different spiritual life forms and this is also the lower fourth dimensional reality uh, that people might experience in the form of seeing ghosts or all the stories of these mythical creatures that we're seeing at different times, possibly even Bigfoot being able to move in and out through dimensions uh, and then making themselves disappear from our eyes in this dense third dimensional reality that we're all experiencing. But putting it in the form of this plasma world where all the paranormal hotspots might have a higher discharge of natural plasma from the earth, making these creatures or these experiences become visible. So, for example, I've been out to Skinwalker Ranch. A friend of mine owns the adjacent property, actually looking down upon the whole Skinwalker Ranch. And I've done a couple uh, night watches there. The very first time I was there, and I was there all alone, just in a, a little RV, yeah. trying to stay up all night and look out the window. And I did see these two large orange orbs Ooh. just slow rocking back and forth on the field. And I was able to tell that they were moving because I was also watching the top of the Mesa at Skinwalker. And they were there for, well, over an hour, and then I dozed off, and then I woke up again, and then they are gone. The very next night, the whole crew or everybody in the Skinwalker Ranch that night, they didn't go out that night, but they were out there the next day and the next night with these big floodlights at the same exact location, which I could tell in the day was maybe a half a mile from the ranch house in the field closer to the front gate. And they were out there doing some kind of experiment or work, perhaps finding some of this remnant of this, this plasmatic uh, universe out there at this very well-known paranormal hotspot up in northeastern Utah. Yeah, very creepy stuff being reported out of that region, or that location, rather. Uh, very strange, by the way. I'm not, I'm not sure if I would want to stay there overnight myself, to be honest. <laughs> I'll tell you what else is creepy about that place. The next day, the caretaker came out and he said, uh, hey, Brad, you want to see some uh, bodies of animals? I said, sure. Took me for a walk on the property, including right on the perimeter of the Sky Skinwalker Ranch property. Yeah. 
and we saw about a dozen animal carcasses. So apparently when these cryptoids come through this portal, which is also appears in dozens of eyewitnesses, as well as even being filmed, if it's nighttime, the background of the portal is daytime. If it's appearing in the daytime, it's nighttime in the background of the portal. And these crypto creatures seem to emerge straight out of this portal, jump to ground, then they become third dimensional beings and then they take off into the wooded areas and apparently they're very ravished, hungry and first animal that they can catch, they devour and just throw the uh, carcass like we might throw a windshield out, (laughs) a a, a banana peel out our, our window when we're driving. And there were there was a deer, there was an antelope, there was even a wolf or a coyote, some kind of dog-like creature that was already decomposing, and a lot of other smaller animals like rabbits and squirrels and stuff. But uh, th- ever since my friend developed his ranch, which goes by the same acronym, S-R- SWR, he is Space Wolf Research, SWR. And ever since he got this property, Michael, yeah. he has had amazing, so far exceeded expectation, uh, not only watching it, but also filming it. So if you Ooh. ever want to go out there, we could do a little uh, uh, you know, expedition. Don't, don't, um, don't, threaten, <laughs> don't threaten me with a good time, Brad. I mean, I would love to go out there. There are other paranormal hotspots that aren't quite as... Uh, in your face, the Skinwalker Ranch. But there's something going on out there, as is evident with this series. I think they just renewed for another fifth season. Oh, my. Uh, the Mysteries of Skinwalker Ranch. Another season. And another season. And then there's not far away, there's a good Juju energy location. That's called Br- Blind Frog Ranch. And Dwayne Ollinger is the host in the show and also i've met him at a couple conferences Uh, nice guy yeah there there is an underwater cave where these blind frogs really do exist but then blind frogs i never heard of that yeah well remember in mammoth cave they would have the fish with no eyes oh right they just get an underground environment that's right and they don't need their eyes anymore so yeah there is a whole world living below the surface that uh we really don't know a whole lot about, and it may have this interaction with this plasma world, which then scientifically weaves in the whole idea of multidimensional beings that can come in and out of our reality, but also uh, be seen for the most part in this unseen realm, Correct. not being seen. Yeah, yeah. And, and some speculate that's where a lot of these uh, things come from in terms of, let's say, the ocean. Uh, some say that's where a lot of these things come from. They hide deep in, into, in, in the uh, depths of the ocean. And, you know, of course, we've always uh, heard stories of underwater submerged objects for the longest time now. And again, one of those, that was actually one of the things I always dismissed right away, actually, when I was a, a lot younger, Brad. I always thought, okay, I, UFOs are one thing, but... USOs, I thought, okay, now you're just smoking crack with Hunter Biden. <laughs> Again, that's a more of a well, modern reference, but that's kind of what I thought in my mind back in like the 90s. That's what it seemed at the time, but with more information and more technology, right. not only being developed, but being understood and backward engineered, that these USOs are very similar to UFOs or UAPs, all the acronyms we have, but basically, what these anti-gravitic crafts can do is create a gravity field around the craft. And the craft yeah. is very much organic. This is what I learned at the uh, Galactic and Spiritual Informers uh-huh. conference when I was talking with uh, Elena Denon. Mm-hmm. And my, my next lecture for 2024 is going to be on underwater archaeology. And we were talking about the Baltic Sea anomaly. Remember uh-huh. that? craft off the coast of Sweden and the Baltic Sea. Correct. And it looks yep. like the Millennial Falcon from Star Wars. Very interesting, yeah. I, I would, I'd suspect that's some <laughs> yeah. for sure. And, and it was determined that it was made out of stone. So I asked Elena, well, if it's stone, doesn't that determine that it had to be a landform? And she said, no, because 
these craft that are so advanced are actually organic creatures. Their technology, they're a craft, but they have the ability to intercede whether to, to let telepathically or with some of the, the headbands that the greys would wear, that they're one in the same, that the pilots are flying those craft using mental projections. So if you know where you want to go and how fast you want to get there, that you're just basically telling the ship, which is an extension of yourself when you're sitting in these chairs with these headbands on and your psi abilities, that you're just flying through the universe with these craft and you can go through wormholes and get to locations very, very quick. So how this related to the Baltic Sea anomaly yeah. is it was saying that these craft are largely organic. So in the case of this Baltic Sea anomaly, it crash landed and then it petrified and turned to stone, much like the petrified trees we found out in Arizona. They were once organic living organisms now they're turned to stone and she said that's exactly what happened with the baltic sea anomaly which must have happened a very very long time ago when the baltic sea was on land because it shows that skid mark of it coming down uh in, into its final resting place and then through another pole shift sank down to its present position below sea level so i'm thinking this one goes all the way back to uh, hyperborea which is the oldest known high-tech civilization on this planet. When I do my underwater archaeology talk, I'm going to break it down nice. into the four ages, the oldest being the artifacts of Hyperboreum and then the artifacts of Lemuria, such as the Yonagoni ruins that are this megalithically carved stone area that even the stodgy National Geographic finally had to admit that it must have been fashioned by a higher intelligence, but it could only have been done during the last ice age or earlier when the ocean wet levels were much lower. Then of course there's the artifacts of Atlantis and there's a dozen or so sites on that I'll show, but then there are also modern age underwater ruins, that being Herclanium off of Alexandria in Egypt in the Mediterranean Sea. And that like a Roman villa near Naples just sank to the bottom of the ocean with some earthquakes that are pretty common in the Mediterranean. In fact, right now, Mount Etna in Sicily is blowing its top again. There's a lot of eruptions going on in the world. So we were talking earlier about the possibility of pole shifts coming up again. Well, Ooh. the earthquakes and the uh, volcanoes are starting to indicate could be true. That's right. That's right, and I'm going to throw a curveball now at you. This is a, a very strange sort of question, but i got to know your opinion here. Obviously, we, we've talked about giants before in America and around the world, for that matter. The, you have the Smithsonian uh, jo jumping in there quick and getting rid of all these bodies, um, Brad, as you know. And we've seen this happen time and time again. We, we've seen how history can sort of be padded to uh, certain agendas and the yes. whole giant thing I'm, I'm sure you can agree with me that that's one of the things that's been covered up for such a long time and I was quick this is going to go with a part a part two but for the first part why do you think the Smithsonian uh, covered covered up these uh, giant bones to begin with well it certainly rewrites history and that could be inconvenient but this goes all the way back to the 19th century in this country when you still had Manifest Destiny, which is the white man's right and privilege to go all the way across the continent and claim whatever land they wanted uh, and yeah. they could kill any animal they wanted. And if the Indians were in the way, you could kill them too. It was a very savage time, but there was a philosophical belief, this Manifest Destiny, that it was ours for the taking. And because we came from a more sophisticated society than the Native Americans, that there, I'm sure there was some ego involved, that uh, we have more of a right to take it. So when you have these giant bones popping up, Michael, it does rewrite the history books to the point where we're not the top of the food chain anymore, that there were these giants that once lived on Earth. I mean, all of the ancient books, such as the Bible and, and other uh, historical accounts 
there are mentions of these very, very large human-like but not quite human giants that once walked the earth. And of course, there's all the skeletal remain evidence as well to show that they had these very elongated heads and they're much bigger than we are, 10, even 12 feet, even higher in height. But uh, <clears throat> they were here on earth a long, long time ago. And I do a whole talk at um, the conferences on the history of the giants. In fact, I'll be doing it at Conscious Life Expo in LA this February. So maybe we'll get a chance to meet up again at that conference oh, too, yeah. Michael. I'll be there. We'll go and hang out and have a great time yet again. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, grab a beer, my friend. All right. It's a date. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's look forward to it. So in terms of uh, dinosaurs, uh, do you think dinosaurs still predate all the evidence of uh, early humans? Or do you well, think there's the a or do you think there's a feature in in, in this uh, alternative timeline somewhere? Yeah, and that's uh, the whole thing with the mandala effect. Maybe there were times, but it would appear that there were certain types of dinosaurs that did blend over into historic times. Yeah. Well, even still today, there are many animals in the world, including all the alligator, crocodiles, uh, yeah. Moto dragon lizards. I mean, th those yeah. are those are large reptiles. Those are dinosaurs that were yeah. from dinosaur days. Yeah. So we technically we still live with dinosaurs. They're just not on the mega fauna side. But what's interesting though, and this this kind of parallels with the giants because there is a lot of talk even at the conferences this last weekend that there are still pods of giants that live on the surface of the planet uh -huh. or perhaps going in and out of caves and also partly living in the uh, inner earth. Uh, and by that, I'm just saying a cave system is inner earth. Yeah. Deep underground military bases are inner earth. There are underground cities. It's a known fact, both modern and very ancient. And so if these animals, you know, we've all heard the story of Loch Ness Monster up in Scotland, uh -huh. uh, into the locks of Scotland, and their inland seas are very, very deep, but they could have a connection out to the ocean where these sea living dinosaurs like pleosaurs had lived. And not far away from my ranch here in northwest Nevada is the Ichthyosaur uh, National Monument where the bones of those swimming dinosaurs mm. can be seen right on the rock. Oh, I love that. So dinosaurs, yeah. but, but dinosaurs would have to have some kind of uh, mating community, males and females, that would have offspring and then those offspring not to uh, mate with their own incestually, there would need to be other. So there have to be mating colonies to keep a species going here. Now, could they have survived out of the purview of modern humans? Maybe in the oceans, probably not on the land, but I have a very compelling book in my crypto creature chapter in future esoteric of a pterodactyl, flying dinosaur on land that was shot over Tombstone, Arizona. Tombstone, Arizona is right near the Mexican border, and there's all these stories of thunderbirds or yeah. these giant birds the ride. that could fly down and pluck a person from the ground, especially a child, and fly away with it. And, and so these hunters, basically these cowboys in Tombstone, Arizona in 1890, right in the, the beginning ages of photography, shot down a pterodactyl and they're all holding it up and that picture has been some people call it a fraud but it's also been forensically looked at in the age of film and if it's on a piece of film that got developed into a photograph that is to me that that's something real especially if that film can be dated to 1890 if that's true so, yeah I, I mean i i've heard of this this photograph and seen it online several times and when you first initially see it, you think, yeah, this could be fake. But I didn't know that backstory, by the way. I didn't know this was on a film somewhere and that was turned into a photograph. I, I've never known. I've never known that. Well, that that's how photography was when we all had film cameras. Remember, you load your film in the back of a camera and take a picture and then right, advance right. the roll of film. You take the roll in. <laughs> Anybody under 30, this is going to sound like uh, pre-technology history. But that's the way I used to develop yeah. all my... No. In, in other words, I thought it was a, I, I thought it was a Photoshop creation, is what I thought. Uh, 
No, because the picture really does date back. Yeah. At wow. least decades. Okay. I remember seeing it in some books that I was reading in the 1980s, and it already appeared before the digital age or Photoshop. But then it begs the question, where did this where did this one come from? It had to yeah. have come from a family of them to perpetuate this long, and that would be in the highlands of Sonora, Mexico. Mm. And then the Thunderbird just flew over the border, and that's where it got shot. Interesting. And, and Brad, I know we are sort of running out of time here soon, but... I just just to just to add more fuel to the fire here, my memory escapes me right now, but I am aware of human footprints being near uh, dinosaur footprints as well in Texas, yeah. I believe, in the Paluxy River. That's right, and I have a picture of that in my book Beyond Esoteric. Human footprints next to very large reptile-like footprints that was in a a marshy riverbed that in the nineteen thirties. Yes. Yep. And then they found it in the 1930s. So that's the whole thing about this. And just to wrap up uh, the dinosaurs living right. into this modern age, Edgar Casey did one of his readings and he was talking about Atlantis when it had been this continent. There were also speakers who were showing us the evidence of where Atlantis had really been. It really did span all across the Atlantic, not as a massive single continent, but a lot of islands that were colonized. And when he was showing us um, the whole continent of, of Atlantis, uh, Edgar Casey was saying how it would eventually fall under the water and then remnants of it would be found in the 1960s. In 1968, they found the Bimini Roads, another one of the Edgar Casey prophecies that totally came true. Well, he was talking about Times of Atlantis, the big dilemma that they had if they wanted to move a colony over to the continental landmass, especially on Africa, is that it was still being roamed by dinosaurs during the time of Atlantis. It was a very wild planet, even with these high-tech colonies, and perhaps that's why they preferred to be on islands where they were pr protected from these dinosaurs. And he said that the Atlanteans were even proposing that they go on these hunting parties to eradicate them from the earth. And that could very well be how some dinosaur species finally went extinct. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. And of course, I could talk to you for another hour quite easily here, but I know we are pretty much out of time here. Uh, but just quickly, though, just quickly, though, I, I again, going back to Antarctica, I know in the past you said that there are three massive crafts in that region, mm -hmm. but locked in ice. Um, wh what do you think is going to happen there? Just to uh, a quick summary here. Well, the three crafts were nicknamed the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria by our intelligence agencies in the 1970s. I think I've pinpointed one of them to be in the German New Schwabenland claim, which is the portion of Antarctica directly south of South Africa. And when I was pouring over the maps before my trips, Michael, yeah. I was coming across what looked like a craft under the ice that you could see on Google Earth. And I pinpointed the GPS to exactly match the Conan base of West Germany. See, the Germans never left New Schwabenland. They stayed there. And that's one of the, I'd say that's one of the three big ships under the ice. Very nice. Well, thank you for that, though, Brad. And once again, I, I do want to thank you for being a part of the program. Always a honor and pleasure. And Brad, go ahead and plug anything you like before we cut you loose here. <laughs> well, if people liked what I had to say on Antarctica, I'm going to be speaking at the MUFON Symposium this summer in Irvine, Texas second weekend of July, and they want me to do my Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica talk. Uh -huh. So I'll be doing that in front of uh, 700 people. Nice. And I'll be doing my Giants talk at Conscious Life Expo. So a lot of these subjects we cover today I do in much greater detail. But the greatest detail of my work is in my books, especially the esoteric series of books. And those can be found at cccpublishing.com. Of course, all bookstores across the country have them too. But if you get it through my website, then I'm able to sign copies for people. 
And if they want it that way, uh, yeah. I'll mail right out to them. Very nice. Uh, Brad, once again, thank you so much for being a part of the program um, once again. And Brad, that just gave me an idea. You know, I do have the ability to show different screens and uh, different videos. I, I think we can do like a sort of mini presentation here one of these days uh, about some of these things you talk about. You gonna show your face on uh, your show, Michael? I mean, I I could, but I don't have a video cra uh, camera. I thought I could just show you your work and all that. Uh, well, sure, we can do that. Yeah, share yeah, screen. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can do that uh, now, easy. Uh, but in, in terms of uh, actually being on camera, you know, I, I would wish I, I could have like a set, so I could have like a smoke machine and all kinds of weird lights going off at random times. You know, it'd be fun, something different for the the, the freaks online, Brad. Well, I like that. Yeah, yeah. See, it's fun. People are very visual. Yeah. In their, uh... <laughs> It'll make sure, them tune let's in. let's do it. Yeah, there's a reason why commercials are about 30 seconds long. It's because that's the attention span of the average American. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. So, Brad, hey, I should also... Yes, sir. My one other website, bradolson.com, which has my conference schedule upcoming uh, 2024. I got one more in December at sort of a private gathering in uh san mateo and then nice. um, i think i booked at a dozen conferences next year already damn you're staying quite busy you're, you know you're you're like the one of the most busiest uh guys i know brad you're you're all over the place yeah, i like to stay busy and occupy myself with that which uh i find interesting and uh rewarding the traveling like man speaking. Yeah, doing interviews, meeting great people like you at these conferences. Hell and yeah. Also, CCC Publishing, my yes. uh, office built business here. And then once a year, I also produce the How Weird Street Fair in San Francisco. But I'm slowly phasing myself out of that job. It's uh -oh. more of a charity work these days. Oh, no. Uh, but I'll make it happen. Understood. We'll find the right successor to come. You Do got it. it, brother. We will definitely talk to you again very, very soon, my friend. Hey, that sounds good, Michael. Thank you for having me on the Michael Deacon program once again. And there he goes, boys and girls. That was our guest, Mr. Brad Olson. Always enjoyed my time talking to Brad. And of course, I have hung out with the man before. And it's a much more different game when you see the person in front of you and you go back and forth on different things and different issues and occasionally have a drink with them. It's a good time and I wish all of you a happy rest of your uh, night or day. And of course, if you ever have a chance to go to any of these conferences, please do. And some of you might like these uh, subjects, some of you might dislike these subjects, but give it a chance. You might enjoy some of these things that uh, we discuss here on the program, especially if you are new to any of this. Definitely go check out some of these uh, conferences that are around your area. You won't be left disappointed. Uh, let me just put it that way. For better or for worse. Now, folks, I... Now, boys and girls, I would love to chat it up with you guys here. Those of you in the chat room, those of you that will listen on the podcast rendition of the program in future time. I do want to wish you well. I hope all of you are ready for the holidays. We are just around the corner from complete chaos. So get ready for that, boys and girls. Oh, get ready. You have to talk to your parents. You got to talk to the wife's parents, the girlfriend's parents, whatever. Oh, and the family. You got to... Talk to the people that uh, you love. Yeah, that's not going to work out for you, is it? Who knows? I wish you the best, boys and girls. And we will return very, very soon, most likely in a day or two. So keep a lookout over at michaeldeacon.com. Go and sign up on the forum. If you haven't already, yes, we have a forum. Go hang out with other people like yourself. If you'd like, and of course, go buy some merchandise and join us on patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. And that is where gold falls from the sky. Check it out sometime. You won't be left disappointed either. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, mahalo. Let's call it a heart attack. Give me some of that knack. This is just a final payback. They all flipped on me. Took my passions, left me be. When I had a place to sit, a goddamn attitude to fit. Talk real smoothly with a spit. But things have changed and I have quit. Got nothing to look forward to But a backlash full of lies You're too late for where you're going This is fate, the whistle's blowing It's much too late It's all too late You're, you're much, much too late. late Like a piss hole punk With his nose turned up
Tell me, tell me what it's like to be alone. And let's not forget the skull face prick. Rafa is fixed to your face. He dropped out of the subhuman race. Thank you.